this video specifically, this training video is about code words and how the left is like co-opting code words, or I'm sorry, co-opting code words and how you as a political appointee should change those code words to be more favorable to your side, to represent what you want more. So they're complaining about the left doing something and then doing it themselves, basically, is what's happening here. This isn't part one. If you didn't see the other, don't sweat it. The sins independently of the rest. I'll give, con uh, I'll give context if it's missing. And while we listen, we're going to play some um, Tears of the Kingdom. Should just be in the background. Won't bother you too much. You never played before. Words matter. Change the words, change the culture. And that's what they're trying to do here. That's the whole point of this entire thing. Change the words, change the culture. Accusing the left of doing it and using that as a pretext to do it themselves. Now. Katie, I know that you've written several wonderful pieces on equity and you've done a lot of research on this and the Biden administration has infiltrated equity into everything. What are your thoughts on equity for the next administration? Okay, let me explain what they mean when they say equity here. Equality and equity are different from each other, right? So equality would be Black people and white people are allowed to live in the same neighborhood if they choose. Equity is recognizing that black Americans have been prevented from entering these neighborhoods in the past. And as a result, there's one black person out of 10,000 people. And equity would try to make that more fair, make it more um, proportional to their makeup in society, to try to like end ghettoization. So uh, another example of equity, forced busing, also called desegregation busing. Schools were segregated back in like the 50s and the 60s and all of that. And the government put a concerted effort into not just desegregating, but specifically integrating by assigning certain numbers of people who were previously segregated to schools that were previously segregated and sending school buses around to pick them up and bring them to those schools to integrate. That's equity. That's trying to make things more fair and proportional, even though those kids technically aren't barred from like going to the school or whatever. Like nobody said you can't go to this school. Um, they have equality in that sense, but equity makes it a reality and, and makes things more fair that way. Uh, equity is also called cultural Marxism, cult cultural communism by the right. And it, it was called cultural um, Bolshevism by Hitler, too. Like the Nazi party bitched about this nonstop about equity. I mean, that should tell you something, right? Marxism, communism, these are economic philosophies and don't apply to society or culture in the same way as they do to economics. So just saying cultural communism, the, the, the phrase alone is ridiculous and nonsensical. Anyway, um, that's what equity is. I'm all for equity. Some people call it social justice. Um, some people call it cultural communism, you know, a billion different words. Oh. Well, it's a little heart stopping, Bethany, and it's going to take a lot to rewind uh, where we are right now with this um, with the left's definition of equity and how that's layered into all federal government documents. Roger Severino states it perfectly in the Project 2025 Mandate for Leadership book, quote, People being opposed to integration? Color me surprised. Dear President Biden, the mission has shifted from promoting equity in everything we do, end quote, for the sake of, quote, populations sharing a particular characteristic, including race, sexuality, gender identification, ethnicity, and a host of other categories. You know, here's another really good example of equity or an attempt to, uh, to accomplish equity. The white community, the white Americans have, like, controlled the wealth since they moved here, right? Like, they bought land and built onto it and everything else. And they've been going around the monopoly board this whole time. The black community in America was no longer enslaved as of 1865, although there were still slaves beyond that point. But they've been 
subjected to Jim Crow laws, segregation, since 1965, or all the way up to 1965. It stopped in 1965 legally. And when it stopped legally in 1965, the KKK started doing it culturally by, like, if a, if some, if a black person, like, got a job at some company, the KKK showed up and, like, burned crosses on their lawns and stuff to run them out. And that has continued on. Honestly, it still happens in some places to this day. There are still segregated proms and stuff today. Like last year, they had one, for example. Anyway, the point is that, like, the black community has just been allowed to go around the Monopoly board, like just now, historically. So 6% of the black community works at this company, for example. Let's just say General Mills. They have 6% black people working there. When the population in their town, in their area is 23% black. And there are plenty of qualified black candidates applying. When you see something like this, it's probably the result of a systemic racist issue. Not even like somebody acting racist intentionally. There doesn't have to be like an intentional racist actor in the system. It just happens. The left is like, they came up with this method of fixing that where all things being equal, when somebody has the exact same qualifications and resume as everybody else, the company should make a decision that favors proportionality, basically. So if you have 26% black people working at your company, but it's only 23% you know, represented in your uh, town, then you would hire a white person who is qualified, all other things being equal. If it's 21% in your company, but 23% in your town, you hire the black person, all other things being equal. That's the same as forced busing, the same as integration in schools. It's the same concept. And Republicans lose their minds over it. As a matter of fact, they just undid that regulation. It's called affirmative action. They undid that regulation, ending effectively um, equity in the workplace, unfortunately. That's what these people are complaining about right now. And they're calling it anti-white racism. It's not. It's not anti-white racism. They still hire white people just like they did before. The issue is not hiring white people. The issue is trying to make things equal. End quote. Equity no longer means all men are created equal, the cornerstone of our U.S. Constitution, but rather now mandates the government to dispense with unequal treatment in order to achieve what they believe to be equal outcomes. This creates divisiveness, not equality. Yeah, another term for this is equality of outcome rather than equality of opportunity when it's just like, it's not how this works at all. They're just misrepresenting it. Again, something that was discussed heavily in culture wars in the 1920s in Germany, like nonstop. There is no unification under these principles. There is no unification under these principles. It is more of a competition of what class is more of a victim. So that particular class. No one says anything about being a victim. It's not about being a victim. It's about making things more fair. But see, therein lies the problem. The KKK lost. They, they were like the, the, the front line, the final defense against black people integrating into society. And now that they aren't like legally allowed to burn crosses on people's lawns, now that it's less socially acceptable than it once was, they've backed into trying to destroy affirmative action. They've backed into the same shit that the Nazis were talking about with their culture wars, cultural Bolshevism, cultural communism. Can receive the preferential treatment being handed out and mandated by the Biden administration. It's important to note that the very first executive order that President Biden uh, signed just moments after his inauguration on January. OK, don't believe anything they say, like literally nothing. These people lie for a living, um, like even trivial, pointless, simple things. Don't don't trust any of it. But OK, let's let's hear what she's claiming here. Order that President Biden uh, signed just moments after his inauguration on January 20th of 2021 had to do with equity. The left applauded as Biden announced his number one priority, which is advancing racial equity. And Yeah, like forced busing, right? 
desegregating people and integrating them into the same communities. Totally. I'm all for it. I love it. Support for underserved communities throughout the federal government. Dude, are, are you shitting me right now? Is she really complaining about Biden serving under, wait, about Biden helping underserved communities? Well, one more time. January 20th of 2021 had to do with equity. The left applauded as Biden announced his number one priority, which is advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities throughout the federal government. As part of that executive that is nuts. In order, within 90 days, every single agency had to file an equity action plan with the White House. If you want to see or view what you will be up against, take a look at those plans. They're all online under the Office of Management and Budget. If they were really bad, if they were like really super racist, these people would have showed it on screen. They've shown you know, PowerPoint presentations and slides and things like that. Why don't, why aren't they showing this stuff? They're complaining about something that's not a problem and trying to convince you that it is a problem by saying you can look it up yourself without actually showing anybody anything. There's gotta be a name for this propaganda method, right? Claiming you have statistics that prove your point, but not showing them. What, what's that, um, what's that called? There's a, a fallacy or a propaganda technique for it. There must be. Just trust me, bro, fallacy. Yeah, that that's what, it, it's gotta be something. Lying, many call that lying. Yeah, but there are specific, um, you know, there are specific propaganda techniques that are used by various groups. Like Russia invented a new propaganda technique. They probably didn't invent it exactly, but they uh, it was coined by their actions. Like it was named when they started doing it. It's called the fire hose of falsehoods, for example. That's the propaganda technique where you go to every single outlet, every media, every social media, everything, as much stuff as you possibly can and spread a number of different lies and see which ones stick. And when you find one that, that really starts blowing up like bio labs in Ukraine or whatever, that's the one that you zero in on. That's uh, the fire hose of falsehoods. There's got to be some name for this propaganda technique. There must be. Since that time, nine more executive orders have been executed by the Biden administration about equity. The latest to date is to further advance racial equity. This entails new positions and responsibilities to be embedded into every single agency and office in the federal government and there is also a directive that all funding that is given out by the federal government prioritize unequal treatment of the American people. The noxious tenets of critical race theory and gender ideology oh my God. should be excised from curriculum in every single public school in this country. Do they really think that CRT is being taught in like a billion different schools across the country? Do they even know what CRT is? This woman on screen might because she's a lawyer, I think. She went to law school, but the legal field kind of seems to me operates off of the principle of an adversarial nature, I suppose. Like that's why we have defense attorneys and prosecutors. It's adversarial. One side goes all out against this person and the other side goes all in for them, in favor of them and the truth will come out and is sometimes right in the middle, commonly. So in law school, people have like a lot of different classes that seem really extreme in one direction or another, like um, critical gender theory, critical race theory and things, intentionally extreme so that lawyers can view things from an extreme perspective and argue for or against it. Like that's just how the legal framework works it's how it's always worked and these people are complaining about the fact that there's like a class or a concept that's designed to teach lawyers how to argue for or against something and view things from different perspectives and they're claiming that it's in elementary schools like what the f are you talking about people it's all lies all the way down always was
So Katie, this is a lot to absorb. So how do you suggest that we tackle the problem? I know you were the head of a grant office at DOJ and you had a lot of paperwork. What are your suggestions? Well, I paperwork. Oh no, not paperwork. I found that developing a process for each type of document was crucial to reversing the words and definitions from the Obama administration. Here's an overall strategy to implement. First, look for any OMB, that's the Office of Management and Budget, White House Office of Management and Budget. Got Wait, so it's actually W-H-O-M-B? Or is it W-H-O-O-M-B, White House Office of Management, uh, Budget Management or whatever the hell it is? Those acronyms don't add up. Want to instruct career employees that you, whatever level you are, you want to be informed of all OMB guidance and how it is being implemented internally. Oftentimes careers will just get an OMB circular or an OMB advice and then they just go along and they either ignore it or they don't put it in. You want to be involved in the process. You want to say every single thing that comes in, I want to make sure that it is actually being implemented. This can easily be handled at the senior advisor or even special assistant level. Ooh, another uh, slide. I love when they put up these insane slides. What do we got? Look for OMB guidance. So Office of Management, uh, I'm sorry, Office, wait, what, what, what did it stand for again? Office of Management and Budget? I'm not even sure what it meant, but anyway. Look for OMB guidance. Instruct career employees that you want to be informed of all OMB guidance and how it's being implemented internally. Be aware of how career employees reporting to you are implementing the president's executive orders and OMB directives. Be involved in the process. So, uh, this is like their attempt to control the language, complaining about controlling the language, and here they are doing it themselves. It's just insane to me. Now, you know, this is the standard strategy. This is how they've always done it. The second thing you need to do, and quickly, are look at guidance documents. Now, I've talked about this in other trainings. Guidance documents are simply a federal career employee's uh, interpretation of of a statute, of an appropriation given by... These people are not good public speakers at all. Honestly, I make similar mistakes. I use crutch words a lot. I say, um, uh, and I forget what I was talking about and things. But these people are streaming or recording training videos for extremists to use. You would think that they would be more skilled orators. They pick more skilled orators in this. Congress of a rule, a regulation, and how it's going to be implemented. A guidance document is not binding. It is simply, in some ways, just their opinion. So you have to write a counter opinion and impose your beliefs, your will, your language on people, is what she's saying, right? The problem with a guidance document is, is that it has a tremendous amount of authority. Because if you are looking to, to an agency to find out what they're looking for for your grant or how your grant program will be implemented or what rules they have around it, you're going to look at those guidance documents. They end up with a tremendous amount of authority. So what she's saying is this is a lot of authority that you have access to and you need to use it to your advantage. Almost no requirements to change this if you're in this position. You, anybody can change it. Anybody can do whatever with it. And it's a, a line of attack that you can use to hurt other people, to take advantage of things. This is absolutely wild. This Right here, this line, matter of fact, I'm going to take this and write it down. When was this? This is 34, 39. It really ends up being the career's agenda being uh, forced onto the American people. A court is the only uh, real institution that can give us a definitive interpretation of any kind of uh, grant program, appropriation, or rule. So most likely, you will, the Office of Management and Budget will come out very quickly with a plan to take down all the guidance documents that are currently up that reflect uh, the Biden administration's agenda. 
Uh, so you'll first want to look at that process. My God, dude, these people are so like stale and dry. Why are they so dry? There's like no emotion in their voice. Look at all guidance documents. Guidance documents are simply a federal career employee's interpretation of a statute or a statue, actually, as it says. Wow. Nice typo, people. An appropriation given by Congress, a rule or regulation, and how it's going to be implemented. A guidance document is not binding. OMB can and should come out with a plan to take down all guidance documents that reflect the Biden administration agenda. This group of people is intentionally setting out to create a deep state. They complain about a deep state constantly and use it as a pretext to create one themselves. There are a whole bunch of employees under the executive branch of government, like FBI workers, Homeland Security workers, and things like that. Just, you know, probably a million people. I don't know. They claim it's two million. I, I, I don't trust a word out of their mouths. But there are a lot. There are a lot of people that work for the government, and they're not in, like, political roles. They're just living their lives and doing their thing. These people want to replace everybody in the government with political appointees, thus creating a deep state, thus creating a group of people who can alter decisions or not carry them out if the president orders them to. They can intentionally choose to contradict what the president wants and control the government effectively. People call you know, the FBI and the CIA and the NSA and everything. They call them the fourth branch of government sometimes, even though that's not really what's happening or what it is. But OK, they call them that sometimes. It's not a fourth branch of government because these people are largely non-political. The Heritage Foundation is setting out to make them political, trying to create a fourth branch of government that can contradict the, the president if they want. This is another method of like cooing the government effectively. You know, there's a judicial coup where the Supreme Court made all kinds of decisions that the American people did not want at all. There's uh, Donald Trump's coup attempt where they rushed the Capitol building. I, that's not a military coup. That's called a, is it a soft coup? I'm not sure. Different types of coups. And this would be like a, what, a, a legal coup? I'm not sure what this would be considered. It's just like, it's insane to me what these people are doing. They never intended this stuff to be out in the public. It was released by the news, by ProPublica, so we have it, luckily. But it's wild to hear the things that they intend to do, the, their plans, when they think no one else is listening. It's just nuts. The second thing you're going to want to do, sort of the second layer, is to absolutely uh, look at things that may not appear to be guidance documents, but are. For instance, one of the documents on our website uh, was supposedly done by a Rutgers you know, professor, and it, so it looked like it wasn't actually career guidance, but when you really dug into the document, it was not part of any kind of grant program, and it really was just a career who asked a whole bunch of questions and a Rutgers uh, professor said yes. So it really, in the end, was a guidance doc. I'm not sure I understand. So is she like giving people um, a way of changing uh, outcomes in the government, even if they're not legal? It sounds like that's like what she's trying to do here. And we brought it down. Another really frightening example when um, I was running. She's talking about frightening. In the Office on Violence Against Women was a provision in the Violence Against Women Act that about gender identity. And if you identified as a woman and you showed up at a woman's domestic violence shelter, uh, you had to be accommodated. My mom was in and out of women's shelters because of my dad. And she told me about this person that she knew there that was a dude. And she was like, why are you here? And he said, I'm a victim of domestic violence, too. And she's like, oh, OK, that makes sense. She moved on with her life, understanding that these shelters should be for people's protection, not just women, people. 
It's just that women are most often the victims of domestic abuse because men have something like they're like 800 times more likely to commit a violent crime or something like that. I don't even remember now. Uh, there are some women who, when they go to like one of these domestic violence shelters, have PTSD about being around men or they're freaked out about it or something. And that makes complete sense. I get that. They should be sequestered into their own like little area or their own room or whatever where they can escape to there if they're uncomfortable with absolutely anything. But, you know, they should be accommodating the people that they are around, seems to me, if they're having an issue. Like, there's a story of a woman who was afraid of beards, afraid of men with beards, because she was, like, taken advantage of by somebody who had a beard once. And she's working with a therapist to try to get past this fear. So the therapist would put on a fake beard and sit on a bus bench outside and she would walk by or vice versa. I think it was actually he would walk by with this fake beard and she would sit on the bus bench. That was the uh, original story. It's called voluntary exposure therapy for people with PTSD that have certain triggers. And you slowly, carefully work up to a point where you can be in the same room with somebody with a beard. You shouldn't be pushed to do it. You should do it of your own free will and in your own time. But that's the treatment for people who are, like, incapable of being around certain types of people. In their case, they need to be put into their own little space where they can do this on their own terms. Men are victims of dom domestic violence, too. In fact, more often than is reported, but they're, you know, people are, view them like they're chicks, quote unquote, if they complain about domestic violence or if they report it or whatever. That's why it's not more common, honestly, truly. So anyway, um, this whole line about women, blah, 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 blah. she's the only one. These two on screen, they're the only ones complaining about this. Women in domestic violence shelters are not complaining about this. Even back in the 80s, they weren't complaining about it because my mom was doing it. And it's honestly like super deeply heartbreakingly sad that these two people are using a group of people who, have, who are already being taken advantage of, who are already being abused, using them cynically to their advantage, using them to get further or to make a point or whatever. It's like really, really disgusting. It's disgusting shit about gender identity. And if you identified as a woman and you showed up at a woman's domestic violence shelter, uh, you had to be accommodated. Um, there were- I don't think you had to be accommodated, but people would, rightfully. The lawsuits, of course, about this as predators use that in order- Wait, which, which lawsuits are we talking about? She, she can't just say there are lawsuits. Give me examples. Who complained about this? You know, domestic violence shelters, are the the workers there they're used to people being complete scumbags that's like their whole bit they deal with that constantly i'm a hundred percent sure that just about every domestic violence shelter in america has dealt with some guy trying to uh, stalking a woman or trying to like get access to her through like underhanded means, sending his friend in or something to deliver a message or whatever other thing. That's the whole thing. That's what they do. And the domestic violence shelters rightfully deny people who they suspect are doing that kind of thing. Even if they have just the slightest little bit of a hint of a possibility that maybe that's what's happening, they rightfully deny people access for the people's protection inside. I've never in my life ever heard of a lawsuit brought by a man who was the victim of domestic violence, or sur the survivor of domestic violence, um, suing some domestic violence shelter because they wouldn't give him access. Never heard of that before. How many times that happened? Like once, twice? And why didn't she just list the lawsuit? Um, there were lawsuits, of course, about this as predators use that in order to gain entry. Predators are not doing this. Okay, you know what predators are doing instead of trying to get into women's bathrooms or domestic violence shelters? They are turning to family members who are vulnerable, like kids. Or, or even more sadistic and disgusting, they're turning to their parishioners, their congregation, their religious followers. 
because they have access to children completely unfettered. That's the kind of shit. Those are, that's where you should look for predators first, your churches. Into a like, didn't the Catholic Church just pay out, like, wait, I think it was the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, um, or the Catholic Church and Protestant churches, like, Christian churches in the United States, and they just pay out, like, $10 billion total in lawsuits for taking advantage of kids, I forget, and then, like, lying about it and moving them around so that they couldn't be caught. It was somewhere in there recently. Or turning towards strangers, like, abducting them. It's true, but that's super uncommon. That's so ridiculously rare. Um, it's like people like slipping in bedrooms and taking advantage of people that way. That's so uncommon. Um, it happens, and you know, you should lock your windows at night, but the most common form of sexual abuse happens among church members, family members of the predators, people like that not among people like trying to get into predominantly female spaces in an effort to take advantage of them the way that jk rowling insists editors use that in order to gain entry into a place where there were vulnerable women seemed to me to be exactly opposite of you know the intention yeah the intention of this is so clearly propaganda designed to hurt people the violence against women act uh in any event the, it was directed toward just the um, Office on Violence Against Women programs. It was in the Violence Against Women Act. But in the Obama administration, the entire grant-making component of the Office of Justice programs, which I later went on to run, it, the head of that office actually wrote a guidance document that said that the provision in the Violence Against Women Act regarding to gender identity was was intended to apply to every single DOJ grant program. Wait a minute. So is she saying that she heard secretly when she was behind closed doors from these people that she's not going to name that this was something that was intended to happen but not actually written down? I am not confident at all because as it was laid out earlier, I do know that, you know, behind closed doors, while I won't name names. If you're not going to tell us what you're talking about or not going to offer any proof, then I have no reason to believe you or your weasel words. Let's listen one more time to these ridiculous weasel words. That office actually wrote a guidance document. I'm sorry, step back a little more. Entire grant making component of the Office of Justice programs, which I later went on to run, it, the head of that office actually wrote a guidance document that said that the provision in the Violence Against Women Act regarding to gender identity was, was intended to apply to every single DOJ grant program that it but it wasn't applied to every grant program and that guidance was not even made public I have no idea if you're even telling the truth right now these people are so like dirty and underhanded and like amoral willing to say or do anything to further their own interests and goals no matter what it is that's just like sick man seriously let's check in through here hang on Look, uh, look at churches first if you want to actually address the issue of grooming or taking advantage of kids. Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. The longest I was ever in a room alone with a teacher at any point in my whole school career was like 45 seconds when they were chewing me out for not turning in a paper or, you know, playing paper football or some stupid shit. I was never alone with a teacher, almost ever. These people are claiming that teachers are like intentionally setting out to groom kids and it's working. It's just fictitious. And they completely ignore church leaders. That right there should tell you what their real goal is. It's not to like protect kids, never was. Wasn't limited to the Office on Violence Against Women. There was absolutely no indication that this was true, but you can see that just by getting that particular uh, uh, legislation passed and the way that the careers then interpreted it created a complete change in culture across the Department of Justice. Did this document even exist? Is she just like making this shit up? I, I believe that she probably is. 
There are teachers that do, but they're abusing them, not LGBTing them, not transing them, not recruiting them for gay naughties. I think that's plausible that teachers are doing that, but I've never heard of that ever happening. I hear about the Catholic Church doing that to kids all the time. I've never heard of a teacher do that to kids, ever. The next step will be to read every single executive order. I would suggest that, you know, starting with an assistant, a special assistant, a senior advisor, that you get every single executive order and put it in a binder and have that binder for the principal and make sure that it's... Okay, let me step back. There were two teachers who got arrested for messing with students when I was at school. Okay, yeah, I, I didn't think about that. Yeah, I suppose you're right. I can see that. Um, all right, yeah, I'll take that. That's fair. Suppose it does happen from time to time. Uh, way, way more common in churches, though. You got to give me that one. Starting with an assistant, a special assistant, a senior advisor, that you get every single executive order and put it in a binder and have that binder for the principal and make sure that it's flagged for them. There will be a lot of executive orders that come out and some of them actually, and know this, repeal other executive orders. So you need to then pull the executive orders that are being repealed so you are very clear about what needs to be redacted. Okay, this is part of a job that a lawyer would do um, are they trying to stick people in positions that normally require legal training? I'm, I'm not sure what she's talking about. So they go through executive orders and look at which laws would be repealed or redacted or changed in whatever way by these new executive orders. That's exactly what lawyers do, that kind of thing. Why is she laying this out unless they're putting people in who are not qualified to do this job and have no idea what they're doing? I don't understand. It's like the whole job is a lawyer in some fields. Now let's go back to that OMB tip that I gave. And just like that, you need to be part of the process that the careers are using to implement executive orders. They call them careers. During the Trump administration, I can tell you that executive orders were, were signed, fully executed, uh, where all the guidance was given. You gave an example of this, Bethany, uh, to our office. And I later found out that it was just simply ignored. It, it, it's not worth, you know, the, the price of the paper it's written on if your careers are not implementing what the president wanted. This is them creating a deep state right here. This is their attempt to create a deep state. What the hell is this transition? I've never seen this transition before, and I've been like editing videos for like 10 years. <laughs> That's super weird. They reverse the image. And I, I mean, I have transitions that are similar to that. That's, that's interesting. What are they using? Premiere Pro for this? All right, we got, how to identify and replace misguiding language. Three, read every single executive order. Be a part of the process that career employees are using to implement executive orders. Inserting yourself into the implementation process. <laughs> yeah, you're not invited to be a part of this, but you're going to insert yourself anyway. It ensures career employees are not inaccurately executing exec executive orders, <laughs> thus diminishing the order's intended purpose and negating positive contributions to the president's agenda. But what they're doing here is they're creating, um, they're erasing career positions where people aren't political, they're just doing their jobs, like, Fauci, he's just doing his job. I think he was appointed. He's one of the people appointed, but he wasn't political. He was just trying to like prevent pandemics from happening or whatever, epidemics. They're trying to erase non-political actors in the system. You know, the, the underpinning of our entire political system is non-political people who just do their job every day. They're trying to erase that. And install people who are specifically loyal to Donald Trump and replacing those people or even knowing who those people are along the way in the next presidency, it, you know, the next Democrat who gets elected is nearly impossible. So basically they're creating a layer of the U.S. government that can defy the president. Like the president is responsible historically for executing laws like you know making sure that they are followed or whatever like the 
Congress creates laws, the president enforces them, the judicial system makes sure that what the president is doing is legal, checks and balances on everybody all along the way. They're trying to create an underlying system in which the president can be ignored. They're trying to take the executive branch of the government and make it loyal to the Republican Party specifically, not to the president. That is a deep state. They're trying to create a deep state. Holy shit, bro. I think you can expect that equity and all of the equity uh, executive orders under Biden will be repealed early in the next administration. This is going to require a very detailed plan to execute the eradication of the dictates in the equity orders. For instance, there's a gender advisor position created by one of these executive orders. That position has to be eradicated as well as all the task force. A gender advisor? What? What'd she say? Orders. For instance, there's a gender advisor position. There is? Is that real? Or is she just like making this up? Created by one of these executive orders. That position has to be eradicated, as well as all the task forces, the removal of all the um, equity plans from all the websites, and a complete rework of the language in internal and external policy documents and grant applications. Which leads me to grants and rules and regulations. Well, grant and grant programs are funded with your federal tax dollars and they are appropriated by Congress. So you get, you are told how much money you have for what particular program. Okay, that's how funding works. And typically your appropriations language will just give a very brief description of the program. And that's the direction that Congress has given the agency. Every single- Is she about to tell us that people should be ignoring or should be lying on these like funding appropriations descriptions so that like they're not um attacked by somebody on like in a political way or whatever like what is she even saying well grant has conditions you want to think of this like a carrot and a stick holy shit you can have your federal money in order to support uh your program but only if you agree uh, to certain conditions, which are built into the grants. When I began at the Office on Violence Against Women, our grant applications were 75 to 110 pages long. Pa yeah, I mean, that's that's what like appropriations bills and stuff are, of course. A short bill, a one page bill has a string of consequences attached. You need to be very specific or people take advantage of it, like her. Pages and pages of guidance that had no statutory or congressional counterpart and tons of conditions. The conditions that you would need in order to receive the money. And you would need to continue to live with those conditions throughout the time of your grant. For instance, to receive grant uh, money, certain so she's complaining that, well, she's pointing out, not even complaining, she's just pointing out that guidance and regulations and things that are set up in these organizations or whatever are not legally binding and you can violate them if you choose. That's the whole point here, right? My God, dude. Programs would have to show a partnership with an LGBTQ support group. I'm sorry, one, one more time. Step back here. If grant uh, money, certain programs would have to show a partnership with an LGBTQ support group. I do. I'm sorry. What? I don't believe that. I mean, unless there is some very specific reason for this, I'm super skeptical. There was no language in the appropriation for that grant that an LGBTQ subgrantee was mandated. The career said it was best practices and it was an Obama pr um, administration priority. This Obama. condition on many grants funded a lot of LGBTQ organizations. So we removed that language and we removed those conditions as we wrote the grants. You know, this right here, this is the reason why 
it's important to vote for a Democrat, even if you don't like the guy. It's important that you support this system because you're not voting for Joe Biden, really, you're, or even Kamala Harris. You're voting for the infrastructure under them. Do you really want this woman right here running the Office of Budget Management or whatever the hell it is? Nobody should want this. This is psychotic. This is intentionally setting out to manipulate the system any way she possibly can. This is creating a deep state. Nobody should want this. No true patriot should ever want this. Okay, this says how to identify and replace misguiding language. Identify and remove unnecessary conditions from pre-existing grants. Beware of existing conditions that fund or otherwise support organizations that are not aligned with the president's policy priorities. Rules and regulations also need ultimate political sign-off and a tremendous amount of political involvement. Your careers may draft initial, you know, the initial documents, the rules and regulations, but there should be multiple political edit edits on the final proposed, any final proposed rule or regulation. The left. So basically, don't leave it up to like the scientists who run the EPA or whatever. You should be dictating what these rules say. I don't care if scientists uh, know more about climate change and how it affects our, our, our environment. It's irrelevant you should be imposing your will on everybody anyway. This is just psychotic, I'm sorry. This is excellent about holding up process. So you wanna expect and prepare for thousands of comments coming from tons of left supported groups on any rule that you put up. So expect that and have a plan to deal with those thousands, tens of thousands of comments. This is gonna be complete outrage over what you just did. So be prepared for that outrage is basically what she's saying right now. In order to move the president's agenda, if you are prepared to deal with the comments that are coming in. They're describing violating the people's will. They're describing how to go about doing something that nobody wants. Nobody, except for like Donald Trump. This is insane then you aren't going to let them delay the rule because they have to be responded to each one of the comments. The careers will want to follow the system that's currently in place for handling comments or conditions or how grants are written. You are empowered as a political appointee to adjust these processes as long as you are meeting all legal requirements. So you may have to deal with pushback really look at your process and change it. You may deal with pushback. What you're doing may be wildly unpopular, but this is how we turn the country into what we want it to be, ultimately. This is insane. All that complaining that these people did about the left controlling this or that or whatever, all that complaining they did, and they're doing it. How to identify and replace misguiding language. Ensure all rules and regulations receive ultimate sign off from political staff, not from just like employees who are just there doing their job, who are non political actors, but political staff specifically. You are empowered as a political appointee to adjust this process as long as you are meeting all legal requirements. Example how to review and address comments and questions regarding a rule. A tip here. In addition to the sheer volume of guidance and conditions to grants and explanations of uh, proposed rules is to ask careers to explain a grant program or the need for a rule in two sentences. It is astonishing how difficult it is for a career who works in the policy or grant space to actually accomplish this. You think maybe that's because these things are like wildly complex you think maybe it's because we have 330 million people in this country and we have to create legislation regulations and everything else uh that accounts for like exceptions and things like that you think maybe that could be it she's complaining about the government being complex and finally use your common sense 
Common sense is not real. I'm not sure if anyone needed to hear this. It's fictitious, okay? Everybody thinks that they have common sense. And in other people's minds, they're wrong. Even if you see something that isn't directly addressed by an executive order or an OMB circular or directed by your agency head, you want to use your common sense to redact the words and definitions which are weakening our nation. As we have discussed, certain words and phrases used together have hidden definitions. A really good example is... They really don't. Social emotional learning. That's actually the new buzzword for CRT or... Okay, wow. They're trying to create a new CRT or wokeism. Social emotional learning. Okay. Critical race theory. Here's a tip. When you see phrases, any phrase like this, one that sounds innocuous, ask your careers to identify the origin of that phrase. Where did it come from? Why are you using that phrase particularly? They're, they're trying to imply that, like, the left is secretly creating this cabal or whatever. It's just insane. What does it mean based on the original intent of those words? And then I would highly recommend you start your own research. As a last note, plan to read a lot of documents. Know how your careers are implementing the president's executive orders, OMB directives. Like, this is what a lawyer does. She's describing somebody with a law degree and and what their job would be reading a lot of legal documents and understanding how they are affected by other documents how executive orders interact with you know um regulations and so on and so forth that's what these things that's what the a lawyer's job is why is she trying to put political appointees in place of lawyers who know what they're doing and be very involved in that process. I can't stress enough the need to control all documents. Create a system where nothing goes out, nothing is published, nothing is put on your website without review by a delegated political or the principal of any office. You have to pass everything through somebody who supports Donald Trump. That is psychotic. Ask lots of questions and do not make assumptions. And finally, if a career employee rushes in and says it is an emergency, and I think a lot of people who are an assistant, chief of staff, um, maybe senior advisor or special assistants are going to have careers just descending on them, talking about how it's an emergency that the principal sign something. That's a red flag. Right away, it's a red flag. Okay. By the time you get into your position, you will realize that the government moves very, very slowly. That's true. Think about your clearance process and how long that took. It, they say it's like trying to turn around an aircraft carrier. These documents. Oh, uh, and wow, she's talking to people who had or who have received security clearance. That is fascinating. Need to be read even more carefully. If a career thinks they can push you to sign something by giving it to you at the very last minute, that will become the norm and it will hinder your ability to actually go through a process, read things, edit things. and So be a complete pain in the ass and don't let anybody do anything unless it goes through you first. I mean, they had said in other parts of this, that they need to consolidate power. They want to consolidate power. That is absolutely insane and disturbing as it gets, truthfully. Make sure that they are completely in line with the president's priorities and agenda. The president's agenda will be in peril from your office if you allow this emergency uh, kind of process. Katie, that was great. Thank you for taking us. No, it wasn't. That process. Do you see the monster is in the attic and it is layered in virtually every document in the federal government, grant applications, rules, regulations. Really, it's not really like the thing they're complaining about is not like layered into anything or whatever. These people are attempting to layer their political views into everything.
They are doing what they're complaining about. Internal and external policy documents, guidance documents, tweets, speeches, and panels. Every one of these phrases or words that are not corrected by being redacted or rephrased is a failure of the presidency. As the Heritage Foundation's president, Dr. Kevin Roberts boldly and courageously states, Oh, dude, that guy is insane. The mandate for leadership. The next conservative president must make the institutions of American civil society hard targets for woke culture warriors. This starts with deleting the terms sexual orientation and gender identity, SOGI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, gender, gender equality, gender equity, gender awareness. Like, why does, he, why does he think or why do these people believe that diversity, equity, and inclusion departments even exist in capitalist systems that are designed to make as much money as humanly possible? It's because they are a benefit to the company, ultimately. These people intentionally are setting out to prevent people from having, like, boards who handle, like, diversity and inclusion or whatever. It's insane. Gender sensitive, abortion, reproductive health, reproductive rights, and any other term used to deprive Americans of their First Amendment rights. Reproductive health is a violation of First Amendment rights? How'd you get there? Out of every federal rule, agency regulation, contract, grant, regulations, and piece of legislation that exists. And the next conservative president will only be able to do so with your help. Are you up for this challenge? We think you are. Together, let's conquer the monsters in Uncle Sam's attic. The end. Jesus Christ, dude. These people need help. And honestly, we need help, too, to keep them out of influence. They're not even elected. They're creating unelected positions that they can use to defy the president if it's like a Biden presidency or whatever. That is nuts. Anyway, tell me what you think about it in the comments.